Good afternoon. Good evening to a few of you. Welcome to today's community briefing. We're glad you're here. Today is the 16th of February. And yes, February is now more than halfway over. So if you had some monthly goals, uh, hopefully you're more than halfway through those goals. And uh, we are, I guess, um, just about halfway through the first quarter. So Q1 is going by and 2023 is going by. It seems like just yesterday was Christmas and New Year's, right? Um, hope everybody enjoyed the uh, Super Bowl. And um, I didn't have a dog in the fight, but it was an enjoyable game to watch. And uh, so we've got some great information for you today. My name is Gregory Sneed. The name of my company is Lifesaver Financial Services, where I help my clients feel better about their money. And I do that through life insurance solutions financial coaching, and financial literacy training, because I firmly believe that when you feel better about your money, you feel better about your life. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage the queen of our community briefing, Miss Crystal Mitchell. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here on a Thursday, third third Thursday in, in uh, February. And yes, Greg, going way too fast. Um, too much work, too much everything, too much everything. I love the Super Bowl as well because I like that Rihanna had on a whole lot of clothes. <laughs> I was impressed by that. But welcome to the community briefing. We are happy to have you here. We have a phenomenal guest today. And we're talking about bridging the racial gap today. And this is a, pro a project and of, um, of the uh, BBA. Black Business Association and our weekly on bridging that gap. So we are excited about that today. The community briefing is the inspiration of mine. I wanted to make sure that we got firsthand information from those in our community, our stakeholders and leaders that were sitting at the table making decisions about us, uh, for us, and we had no input in, in that decision. So that's the purpose of the, um, the briefing. It is sponsored by uh, sponsored and powered by Recycling Black Dollars and the BBA, Black Business Association, and we are financially sponsored by Southern California Edison, Wells Fargo Bank, SoCal Gas, and our newest sponsor is PCR. So we want to welcome you. We have a fantastic team, Mr. Gregory Sneed, myself, and Mr. Stephen Turner, who's the producer, and Ms. Robin Billick is back with us on Thursdays. Hey, <laughs> and I am the co-director of Recycling Black Dollars, and this platform, as I said, is our networking platform to make sure that we're uh, connecting with each other and making sure, as uh, Pastor Smart said a couple of weeks ago, keeping our dollars in our community, empowering our community, empowering our businesses so that we can do better and better uh, um, uh business and as well as to create economic um, security in our community. So with that, I am going to flip it back over to Stephen um, or Robin or Stephen, if any of you want to say hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm, I'm always delighted for these Thursdays. Every Thursday is always so informative. And again, you guys, we ask that you um, support the, the community briefing by signing up on our YouTube so that we can actually get our own channel. And certainly as, as um, our fiscal steward would say, any funding that you could suggest and or want to donate, we, we would appreciate it. Good looking out. All right. Awesome. And Stephen, you passed on the saying hello. All right, you'll, you'll, you'll hit us in the- You'll be back uh, in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we welcome Steven. Steven's got a brand new uh, webcam. So he's looking crystal clear and sharp and handsome. He's got a very and good- And <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's good, Steven. <laughs> and, and he got the microphone. So when you do hear from him, he's going to sound like, what well, is radio announcers and come through, you know, the bassy voice. So he'll, we'll hear from him at the end of the program. And uh, I don't know why strange things come to my head, but do you remember Mrs. Doubtfire? She said, hello. <laughs> so we say hello to Haypen M. And she's our guest speaker today. She is the president and CEO and founder of Faith and Community Empowerment. And the acronym is FACE, F-A-C-E. Okay, so you gotta have an acronym these days. You just can't have a name, you gotta have an acronym. So uh, she founded the organization and uh, it's based here in Los Angeles. 
Uh, she is also or had been a board member with the uh, Forum for the uh, Theological Exploration. Um, Americans Leaders of Change, a fellow. The uh, German Marshall Fund fellow. Uh, she's been with Renaissance Capital Partners. The California Science Center, a sponsorship manager. She went to uh, school wise, she went to UC Berkeley and got her Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration. Also, uh, the University of Southern California. Any SC folks in the house? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, she had an MBA in marketing. And she also has her Master's of Divinity from Wesley Theological Seminary. I didn't get a chance to find out, Haypin, uh, where you grew up. So I don't know if you grew up here in the uh, Los Angeles or Southern California area, so you'll share that with us. And um, she is looking to make a positive impact and transformation of our community, our society, all in a faith-based environment. It's my pleasure to welcome Haypin Im. Thank you so much uh, for this invite. I feel very honored uh, to be joining in uh, in this space. Um, again, my name is Hei Pinim. I serve as president of Faith and Community Empowerment, or FACE, and we say we strive to bring the face of God through service and lift those who are faceless. And I have to say that I grew up in Southern California, Orange County, um, but then um, my parents being in ministry, they ended up moving to Bellflower, so the LA County area. And, um, you know, when they answered God's call to ministry, they thought they were going to preach the gospel, lead people to God, do Bible study. They did all that, but they also ended up really becoming unpaid social workers. And I think that is true for many of uh, faith leaders. They end up becoming first responders. And in my heart, um, I always carried this desire, could there be a better way for them? And I grew up and I got to know uh, Reverend Mark Whitlock and Pastor Cecil Murray at First AME Church. And I saw this amazing model when faith leaders are able to create an affiliated nonprofit and partner with the broader community, the impact that they can make. Um, and so um, in that they could get paid also, <laughs> but again, they were bringing in uh, on top of the three million offering, a twelve million dollars in additional resources. Uh, but you know, something else that was really powerful was that that I think is relevant to our conversation today is about that because of the partnerships in place, the stakeholders, whether they were government entities, politicians, corporate America, and whoever, suddenly had a stake in the church's success. And as such, they were lauding the work of the church in rooms and places where God, church, and communities of color are rarely mentioned. And I saw First Amy Church grow in influence, welcome, um, and being perceived as a value contributing stakeholder. And when important decisions are being made, they're being invited into the decision making room. And I said, wow, this is an amazing model. How can I bring it to my community, right? God gets honored, people get help, you get paid, and you know, you're know you welcomed and invited and invited into the decision-making room. And so long story short, it was just a passing thought of, gosh, I could bring it to my community, but God had some plans. <laughs> and a lot of miracles later, our organization formed in 2001. And so I want to first start off by just sharing a short video, a highlighting from our 20th anniversary, which was two years ago. So let me start off with that. Um, I got to share. Yeah, and, and click the, uh, be sure to click the button where it says share audio. Yes, I will do that. Okay. Fantastic, good. Thank you. So let me, can you see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn it on. Oops. So, All right, we got our fingers crossed. Doing, doing, yes. doing. <laughs> and again, you know, when I answer God's call to ministry, which is a part of my story, I just never imagined the places that God would take me, especially, again, riding on the shoulders of my parents, but also the model that I got to learn through First Amy and the Black community. And so this was me with President Biden 
and then Vice President Biden and the only female faith leader in there. Every, the other folks are uh, President Biden's staff. Uh, so again, it was a tremendous, tremendous honor. So let me click here. Oops. There. Over the past 20 years, FACE has brought hope, light, and voice to the world, enhancing the AAPI community's participation, contribution, and influence through faith and community partnerships. Since 2001, FACE has garnered over 800 partners from the White House to Fortune 500 companies. FACE has trained over 5,000 faith and community leaders on community development through our C2 Leadership Institute and National Lighting the Community Summit. We have brought the hope of home ownership to over 11,000 families and individuals. We have saved families over $92 million worth of mortgages from foreclosures and connected people with over $1.8 million in down payment and other forms of assistance. FACE has been a beacon of light to many faith-based and community organizations providing them over $400,000 in subgrants. Recently, through FACE's advocacy, 3,000 API youth will receive paid job training and internships through LA County, which is the first award of its kind. This year has been wrought with much pain, not only due to the coronavirus, but also the hate virus, leading to much anti-Asian violence and racism. In response, FACE has served as a voice for the AAPI community combating the model minority myth and fighting to stop Asian hate locally as well as nationally. Despite the increased pains of the AAPI community, FACE has brought much hope for healing and unity through our Black and Asian solidarity efforts. FACE convened numerous Black Asian solidarity gatherings which resulted in fostering deep understanding through tough conversations and truly being a light to the world. As we celebrate our 20th anniversary, we are grateful for the partners, friends, and supporters who have helped us to be where we are today. We thank you and we hope you will continue to uplift our organization to serve as hope, light, and voice to the world. To get involved or support our efforts, visit www.facela.org. And so that um, is a short introduction. Hopefully this is not gonna play again. So, okay. And then let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, and so again, it's uh, it's been an amazing ride uh, for which I feel truly blessed, all the friendships and partners that we have been able to work together. But as mentioned, um, there has been a growing um, anti-Asian violence, uh, but I wanna first start off to say there's hope uh, I remember, you know, because of American society that seems to uh, really depict minority communities in a negative light. Growing up, I didn't think Asian men were really that cute or sexy. And uh, but when I went to college, I, I saw the light. But I have to say, you know, with BTS seeing 100,000 non Asian women or girls screaming their head off and speaking in Korean language back to was kind of an amazing a moment of affirmation that the world can change, right? Uh, but I do want to share today. Um, you know, my journey in terms of as an Asian American living in this country, but really, again, how um, combating the model minority myth, but also bridging that racial divide and the fact that, you know, how can we all stand together in unity? And so um, there has been over 339% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes nationwide. Uh, but for us, it's not a matter of just physical violence, but it's really a matter of erasure, exclusion, and demonization that I believe fuels um, our uh, experience uh, in terms of the anti-Asian violence. And I'm sure that, again, uh, these are things that resonate also uh, with uh, individuals in the African-American community. 
I do want to go back to the fiscal uh, violence here that um, out of all the different communities, Asians are, and this is pre-pandemic, and I'm, ass I'm assuming that the numbers are even higher, but we are victims of, the um, have the highest rates of being uh, victims of violent crimes from those outside our community. And I want to say that uh, for, for my thought is that a lot of the current violence on Asians really came as a result of the narrative that was really lifted up, amplified, and reinforced during the LA riots. And I think even the word riot versus civil unrest and uprising uh, for the Asian community, I have to say that it was a riot where over 2,200 uh, businesses were destroyed in our community, which was uh, make up, making up 40% of the billion dollars in damage. And 65% of the, you know all the businesses that were vandalized were Korean owned. And it took 4,000 federal troops and 2,000 National Guards to restore order um, as well. Um, but really, for me, um, in spite of this devastation in our community, one of my strongest, closest mentors, whenever I would mention about the LA riots, um, instead of responding with empathy, there would be this hardened look on his face. And that confused me because I knew that this individual uh, but actually so many other Black leaders in so many other settings around the LA riots, they were great people with great empathy. Um, and yet whenever the riots uh, and the mention of the Korean community, especially the store owners, they would have that look, the hardened look. And actually my former uh, boss mentor actually even mentioned um, that he said, oh, I heard these store owners burn their own stores because of insurance money. And so again, that was a, a place of great pain because if they were people that I believed were bad people, I could just blow them off. But because I knew that they were good people and I wanted to stay in relationship, and yet this piece where there was dissonance, I needed to be reconciled. But I was also, again, seeking understanding of why this was happening. And there was kind of this aha moment where I realized that there were certain myths that were being told about these store owners who are receiving special government assistance that were exploiting and were outsiders that really don't belong there or that were targeting um, the community to sell bad goods, bad goods and that were racist and, and so forth. And so, um, and when in reality, there was kind of a whole different set of truths. And so in that way, um, I have been on a journey to lift up <laughs> the truth. You know, as a believer, there's a verse that says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And, and so part of my presentation today is to share more of the truth telling in a way that really reveals that we're all, again, uh, victims of the same system that uh, discriminates. Um, against all underserved communities. Um, and so I would, and again, some amazing things have happened, but just to start off, I think, you know, during COVID, um, our communities have been heavily impacted, but it's interesting that when Pew did this study of who has been impacted since the COVID-19 um, outbreak, you'll see, you know, that both Asian and Black community we had the highest report of people acting com uncomfortable around us. There's a lot more data, but also the greatest fear of being physically attacked. Again, you'll see that Asian and Black community uh, have the highest rates. So again, just I just want to draw some of these data points uh, uh, to share part of our journey. Uh, for the Asian community, I talk about erasure. We are the second largest minority population. Uh, in the state, in the county, and in the city, and yet we continue to be erased. We're not on stage as speakers, we're not on talking points, and we're definitely not on PowerPoints, right? Um, but I want to just share an example. There's 50 of us, 50 groups <laughs> under the AAPI umbrella. Um, we don't share 
languages, we don't share cultures, we don't share borders, right? And actually out of that 50, there's 100 languages. And so usually when you aggregate all of us together, it really masks the suffering of many of the subgroups. And so if you were to just look at the yellow, uh, white home ownership is 66, Asian is 61%. So that looks like we're very wide adjust, adjacent and privileged, right? Compared to Hispanic 48 and Black 42. But when you disaggregate, you'll see that Korean and Black home ownership rate is the same. And there's seven other API subgroups below the Korean and Black home ownership rate. And then there's 12 API subgroups below the Hispanic home ownership rate. And if you look closely in LA County, um, that was the earlier one was nationwide. Uh, but if you again disaggregate, you'll see that Black, Korean, and Mexican Americans have the lowest assets in LA County. And talking about language barriers, which again, for many of the Asian American community, even though for Korean history, it were over 115 years, but Again, because of the US system that prevented the vast majority of us even from entering the United States because they want to keep America white. Um, and so uh, for many of us, the bulk of us are new immigrants still. And so language is still barriers. So in the city of LA, actually you see Koreans have the highest language barrier. And yet during COVID-19, much of the city announcements, resources and programs was not translated into Korean language. Talking about the criminal justice system, you know, um, juvenile delinquent should be tried in juvenile court. But again, the color of justice is not applied evenly. And you'll see here that for Asian and Latino youth, we have the highest rates of being tried in adult courts instead of juvenile courts. But once tried, you'll see that Black and Asian youth have the highest conviction rate. And I know that for Asian Americans, because there is so few resources being directed to our community, once they fall, they have a hard time picking themselves back up at all you know, uh, situations. And so um, during COVID-19, um, you'll see in May 2020, actually Asians had the highest death rate. But again, Black and Asian, we're right there on top, right? But very few attention was given. And then you look in New York, which was the, the you know, the pandemic, uh, what is it, epicenter. And you'll see in April of 2020, when all everyone started filing for unemployment, um, that Asians, had, again, had the highest at 10,000% when the next group was at 3,000. So again, very extraordinary. And it continued um, even in the, the, the following year. And again, I've mentioned, you know, that Pew study, like who faced the most racism during COVID-19, um, the Asian community, but again, the Black community is right next door to us. And even to this day, um, the you look at who's the business owners, you know, in terms of their financial condition, Again, Asians is at 39%, but again, Black 36%. So again, we're right there uh, with the Black community. Um, these are some earlier stats when they actually disaggregated, again, the data. You'll see that Blacks in South Asian and Chinese had the highest hospitalization rate in New York, right? Um, and you look at frontline workers, you'll see that actually Asians, 20% of all doctors in this country are Asians, right? Uh, frontline workers in terms of registered nurses, 9.8% of all nurses in this country uh, were Asian and so many others, right, um, as well. And yet, again, we keep on being erased. And so I know that, uh, you know, Dr. Susan Rice, Ambassador Susan Rice, who was appointed by President Biden uh, to be the one infusing um, you know, equity into all parts of the government. She said, look at the COVID crisis, which disproportionately sickened and black, uh, killed black and brown people who are the frontline workers, the essential workers. But again, um, many of the Asian community as shared were also disproportionately sickened and killed, but no mention. And so we continue to be erased. Um, 
And even for the PPP loan programs that benefited the country and the business owners, again, because of lack of outreach resources, investments, all those things, um, Asian owned businesses had the lowest rates of even receiving the PPP loans. And a lot of the equity initiatives, uh, for example, Chase shared 30 billion. It was an amazing program to really, again, uh, you know, uh, really close the racial wealth gap, right? Um, and so they had many initiatives with housing and businesses and things of that nature. But in their announcement uh, and their policy, it targeted Black and Hispanic, but left out the Asian community. And part of, I think, um, the, the modern minority myth um, is the reality that Asians because in their home country, education is the only way out. They come to this country for their children's education. And you'll see here that literally Asians shoot through the roof. I mean, I remember for me, I was literally having huge fever blisters about to kill over. And my mom working on minimum wage begged me to come to school, right? And if I couldn't stand it, that she would come and pick me up. And so that is the extreme that Asian families would put for their children's education. And yet, in spite of their high education attainment rate, in terms of their success in the workplace, it is actually the lowest. And so you'll see the blue in the private sector that Asians have a probability of being promoted 55, Black 65%, Hispanic 74, and then white 111%, right? So again, I just wanna emphasize again that the Asian and the Black community, we are again, uh, in many places, the same boat. So I believe mentorship is a very important part. And I think this community, Briefing is an example of mentorship, right? Sharing where the cheese is, right? Um, and so the county has this amazing program called Youth at Work, and uh, which pays $16 an hour uh, for ages 14 through 24 with 600 employers for government, corporations, and nonprofits. And even though we represent 17% of the top population, um, and yet only 3% of the participants for AAPI. And so we pursued for two years to, uh, to do some intentional outreach. And through that, um, within a, two weeks of our announcement, 400 Asian youth signed up. So again, it's not lack of interest, right? But just lack of outreach. And um, I have to say, again, for all our programs, we share the love and the good. So all the students who come, whether they're Asian or non-Asian, we have been able to share the information. I want to highlight the importance of platform and mentorship. Do you remember Susan Boyle with Britain's Got Talent? Right, she came on stage, this frumpy old lady who didn't look the part, everyone dissed her. And I think that's the reality for many communities of color, including the Asian community. Uh, but you know, as soon as she opened her mouth, that was quite a transformative moment um, in which she became a global star, right? Um, and yet her skill was there, talent was there before and after Britain's Got Talent, but that platform and the mentorship, right, made the world of a difference. And so really, again, I want to say that whether um, communities of color in the African-American community, Latino, Native American, but also again, the Asian community needs that mentorship. And again, there is this amazing resource that's out there. And I think the model of First A Me Church would be something that could be, uh, what is it, replicated, right? And so, um, I actually uh, started this initiative called the C2 Leadership Institute that we share the love with all communities, but it has been a game changer. So I would like to share um, this video. It's three and a half minutes. So where do you want to be in the next six months? It's an ad there. Oops. You okay. <laughs> C2 Leadership Institute is about cultivating leaders at the intersection of church and community. Many faith leaders as first responders are doing great work, but do not have the tools, resources, or mentors to tap into the power of partnerships and sustain their efforts. The C2 Leadership Institute provides such resources.
my perceptions that the broader community was not interested in the church does, but they are. When I reached outside the church wall to serve the community, it sparked hope. My experience with the C2 leadership has expanded my breadth of understanding around the community engagement, working with funders, the importance of the ask, creating a pitch. Um, I've learned so much creating a, a community uh, development corporation, learning how to speak to funders, um, how to get grants. It has been equally inspirational and informational, expanding my imagination and giving time to re reimagine, refocus, and re-strategize to be uh, an increasingly competent uh, religious leader in our community. How do church leaders better connect with the community that they serve? Uh, I understood the basics, um, but I've never put in this kind of work. Um, I had never created the building blocks that enhance my ability to lead a church and connect that church with the community. ministers here today. You know, you all found your calling, serving people. I have found my calling, serving people. We all serve the same constituents. So I thank all of you for participating in this program. Thank you for getting more involved. We need to hear your voices. Again, the stories you've done so far, you're on, you're there, right? And you're on the road and you're doing so many great things. We at CIT, we need your help too. Uh, and CIT is proud uh, of support base, um, you know, and the C2 leadership program. And we look to continue to do that. And just a quick word of how this came about. Hampton and I were connecting on some other matters and this program came up. And it was a perfect match because we were looking for, in the conference, to develop some mission field engagement community development programs, training programs. From that standpoint, we are so excited and we're looking for this as a model for the future for us. This won't be the last cohort. And so again, um... We love to share the goods, but I think that, you know, for us as a Korean American community, again, the, the hate and the narrative um, that pitted our community against each other, um, that pain continues. And I remember reading this lyric uh, from Ice Cube. It's almost, it's really traumatizing to even try to read it. Um, but I think, again, um, there is that narrative that really uh, demonizes these store owners. Um, thankfully, there was some peacemaking uh, with Ice Cube, uh, but I do want to say that for these store owners, their reality is that it is the most second most dangerous job of being killed while working. Um, so many of them are risking their life, and because it's from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m., um, and I asked my husband who, who ran these business and is a, was formerly a business broker, how much do they make? Typical business. They make $3,000 after expense, but before payroll. I went, what, 3,000? That's not even enough for one person, but really for, uh, usually it takes four people, right? Two shifts and someone at the cashier, someone to stock. And so really they can't sustain it and they end up working the long hours, the two shifts and using family labor, which is what happened uh, with my husband's family. And so again, they're putting their life at risk, working excessive hours and making very little money and being very traumatized. And I think I want to touch upon Latasha Harlins because I know that whenever the LA riots comes soon, um, Rodney King's video is played and then Latasha Harlins is also played. Um, and I have to say that really 
Latasha Harlan should never have been killed. Should never have died, period. Um, and I want to also say that um, that I felt like our two communities were being played because as they played the Rodney King video, they played also Latasha Harlan and Sunja Du's video. What they didn't share is that there were 20 Korean store owners who were killed by their customers during that same season. I'm just wondering if with that greater context, would 2,200 business owners have been destroyed? And even that narrative that continues and fuels uh, the anti-Asian violence, I'm wondering. So again, I wanna say we shouldn't be played. And for Latasha Harlins and Sunja Du, it is too late. But I think that we can still tell the greater truth and find better solutions for both our communities to forge ahead stronger together. And I want to say for Sunja Du that in her re live reality, um, again, not a justification, but understanding her context of coming up with better solutions, she had been threatened more than 20 times of people coming in that her store would be burned. Her store was burglarized over 30 times, and she was facing 40 shoplifting incidents per week. I don't know, for me, you know, making 3,000, <laughs> barely making it, highly traumatized, even if it was once a week, I think I would go crazy, but 40 times a week. And that's not just the reality for her, but really the reality of these store owners and her son's life was being threatened by gang members. Again, there's just a lot of attacks uh, that are still happening uh, in the Asian community, including um, this was an article in the LA Times, a family had been working at the store um, and they were about to retire finally. Um, you know, they were about to sell their store and the mother was stabbed in the back and she lost her ability to move. She was paralyzed. She lost her voice. Her daughter said that because they were working so long, um, in the stores, they don't even have a decent family photo together. And yet I would say many of their pain, it just doesn't get covered. There is no uh, community outcry, et cetera. And I saw, this is no one famous. I saw it here. Um, and there's a quote that I appreciate. It says, it seems a lot of times people are scared to challenge racist comments made by people of another race for fear of being branded as a racist themselves racism should not be tolerated regardless of the race of the person committing. And I thank the Lord. Um, this was a photo on the front page of LA Times uh, being hugged by Shanice Harlins and there's Lorna King, Rodney King's uh, daughter and who's not shown is Najee Ali. Uh, but Najee Ali um, reached out to me to reach out to Latasha Harlins family. And honestly, I, didn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole <laughs> because I felt the narrative was tilted in so much in one direction. What could I say that would express empathy and at the same time not sacrifice also the pains uh, of that the Korean community experience? And I had none. So I really actually just was going to blow it off. But it was a friend, another friend who said that this was need to be done. And I really, it, fortify myself with God's verse of the key and not giving me a spirit of fear. <laughs> um, and I reached out, really counting on that God would give me the words. And to my surprise, uh, Shanice was very open. And we ultimately ended up at this press conference. And she also came to speak at our event on the April 29th at the 30th anniversary. And she sent a note saying yesterday was a massive it was a breakthrough. Thank you for the love and massive respect. And I also want to thank Naji Ali at our Saigu campaign commemorating the 30th anniversary. Um, he came out to just acknowledge that he had not, as a leader in the Black community, uh, cried out uh, for unity, right? Um, that he had the right to, the, to be angry about Latasha Harlins, but not the right to unleash that on the fellow Angelinos. And he held my hand and it got captured uh, by the LA new, uh, newspaper for which I'm so grateful. And recently another store owner was killed uh, over a wig. Najee Ali called me to say, hey, not enough attention is being brought to this. 
let's call a press conference and all the major media has come. And remember my former boss, <laughs> the one that said about the, the insurance, the, the store owners? Well, you know what? We've been on this journey together. I cry in gratitude. Um, he volunteered to write an op-ed titled Asian Lives Matter. And um, I asked him why he was doing this, right? And it was published in the LA Sentinel and the um, Christian Recorder that goes to all the Amy pastors. And he said that he didn't want to be guilty of doing to Asians what white people had done to the Black community. Um, and so we've been on many events. And last but not least, really, Dr. Barbara Williams, uh, former head of the Black Congressional Caucus, um, she also came to realize that justice for the Black community, realizing that we were all Asians were also victims of the same racist system, that justice for the Black community could not happen without justice happening for the Asian community. And since then, she has invited me to numerous uh, efforts and uh, initiatives that she's been part of. And we were able to join forces to write an op-ed in support of Justice Kentonji Jack, uh, Brown Jackson when she came up for nomination. And most recently, um, you know, we were we are partnering with the LA County uh, African American Employee Association and the African Council Corps to bring our home ownership resource. If you guys want to become a homeowner, <laughs> there we can potentially help you up to two hundred thousand dollars in down payment assistance. And finally, in closing. Um, I don't know how many of you watched the Squid Game, uh, but in that uh, movie, the game master set up a game in which the players would not end up becoming a winner until they ended up killing and hurting each other. And the final winners, um, the two winners is lifelong friends. And as the, there has to be only one winner, that uh, individual, as he's about to step into that prize winning, he wakes up to the truth that it will come at the cost of the life, uh, the loss of his friend's life and also his integrity. And basically he turns around and tells his friend, we don't have to live by these rules, let's go home. Um, and I want to say that part of my journey has come from a position of love. <laughs> Um, particularly our relationship with the Black community who have been so many of my greatest mentors. Um, and I've mentioned to Sarah the other day, I felt like, you know, it was someone who has a boyfriend that their parents don't approve. <laughs> and you want the greater truth where they could see what I see. And I am so grateful. I think we still have a long ways to go, but at least in the areas that I've been able to build partnerships and friendship, um, it is going in that direction. And in conclusion, I wanna just say that I am sure that it's not just the black and Korean community, but we tell myths of each other in all communities that keep us divided. And so in that way, I hope that we can join forces, right, in addressing, <laughs> fighting the racial divide to look at those myths, right, and fight for seeking the truth. Thank you. First, I want to say amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I, I second that. <laughs> and, and secondly, um, we, you know, we have guests uh, and some are in the uh, faith um, uh, environment. Um, but there, there are some, and I'm going to include you there, where you can truly know that it's God with, within them, um, and they're not just using the uh, religion or church as a, a way of making money or having mm -hmm. notoriety or being in, you know, uh, yeah. in, in public. So uh, we appreciate the the works and the efforts that you're doing, and uh, applaud your your work um, and your efforts. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn over to Crystal soon, but I did have a question for you. Sure. Um, because as you start reading, um, when we mention about, you know, the Asian community, it's obviously inclusive and it's also very specific. So here in the California or Los Angeles area, the Asian community is, um, perhaps predominantly Korean, but there's also Japanese, uh, Thai, 
Yeah. Um, you know, I start reading things about, you know, the Middle East is a construct that it really is Central Asia. So there are a lot of uh, countries that we would consider in the Middle East that are Central Asian. Um, so, so how do, are the other communities outside the Korean also involved, or do they embrace that, or where where are they with that? Um, yeah, so I've been in many rooms, and I think the social media platform that we can, as Asian Americans, because usually they don't give us a platform, right? Really, so we don't even get to see each other. And I think you know during the whole George Floyd protest that there were more visibility of Asian Americans because. We didn't have to ask for permission. <laughs> we, through social media, with that money, <laughs> with that investment, we could see each other, we could mobilize, and we could show up. And so I think it is, you know, working towards a, a different reality for us. And so, again, we have all been working together. I'm in many rooms because of that social media platform that we can connect. And I was also, you know, I'm in my 50s now, right? Um, and I would say my comfort is more no, English <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> than in Korean. But I think, um, you know, I came when I was seven and I think there's more of us in the Asian community who have come of age, who have some more influence. And so we're now able to bridge that language divide in, amongst Asians. Like I said, it's just like, you know, Japanese, Korean, we, it's a completely different language. And so really the first generation who are immigrants just trying to survive, um, they just didn't have that bandwidth. But I think our generation, right, there's more of us coming that are able to now connect uh, amongst within the Asian community, but also across, again, the Black community, the Latino community, the Native American, and so many others. And so I think that is a game changer um, that I'm so again grateful for the social media platform. Crystal, over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, hey man, thank you, hey man, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, um, and, and your comment on Korean men, wow. I watch Korean uh, pop, K-pop, like every other night. I've seen everything on every channel, on every network. I absolutely, that's one of my favorite genres. And I must say, your eyes were closed, my dear. So <laughs> I'm going to say that to you first. <laughs> Thank you. And I have my favorite actors. But I also know that when we talk about the race, uh, racial divide in America, is that the majority, the dominant, uh, they want us to be pitted against each other. That is part of the strategy, has always been a part of the strategy. I have many friends from other countries, and when they come in, is they're given that impression that the African American is bad and, and that they should stay away from them and that they are different from them, no matter where you come from, whether in, anywhere in Africa, anywhere in Asia, anywhere you come from, the African, the black person is the one that is the one that's creating the worst damage here in America. So you come in already with that feeling or, and that you have to be wary of each other. So we have to understand the strategy that is going on here. And so us uniting all minorities, black, white, a black, Asian, Hispanic, that gives us a dom that gives us the majority, and that is the fear today. So uh, racism has is has heightened uh, because of that. Because by 2030, they feel they they will be a minority, and we will be the majority. And so, and I would say because we make up the the 13 percent, and you guys are a larger percent know that there is there's a reason why the exact same reason that is happening to us your population your 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 communities are growing and because the asian population covers anything that was on the uh the uh, asiatic continent that means there's just definitely more of you guys so that's where the fear is coming in so if we do all join together and unite against this fight uh, then we can preserve and protect all of our races and all of the people in our races. And uh, ultimately, I want to say again, if you think about Susan Boyle, right? Her yeah. Yeah. God-given potential or talent was hidden. But now because of that platform uh, and mentorship, we can all be beneficiaries of her gifting. And again, I think each community 
offers that. And I think we should all learn to be curious and again, uh, overcome our desire to go to that default myth or narrative and really become curious, right, um, as well. I, I quite agree with you. Um, I will say this. I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a video in the chat. Um, I'm really. It's called the Journey of Man, and it talks about um, when uh, um, the African, the first African, uh, left uh, the continent, and it talks about the journey. A doctor, Dr. Spencer uh, Wells, he followed the DNA across the cut the world. Uh, their first step outside of, of Africa was in um, India, and then they went to the Himalayas. So we are all related. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody on his, on his, yeah. is related, whether you're black, white. And he talks about the, the journey, but he did it through, uh, through DNA. So he, he took everyone's DNA from all around the world, and he, he showed the tracks. And so we are all connected. There is a question here uh, that is from Robin Lee. Probably. Yeah, she wants to know, how can we personally help in community empowerment and coalition building toward through faith? He understands you do events such as first time homebuyer programs for marginalized communities because you believe in equal access to shelter and livelihood. I agree. This is uh, Robin speaking. She agrees and it's across the cross cultural community empowerment. She wants to know, is it just working or is faith just working with and through churches or, or is there a greater context? Well, so we actually work with the greater context. Uh, we are being intentional that the faith community, I would love every faith community to be like First Amy or West Angeles, right? Uh, really because they're already doing good work. They just haven't learned how to package it and to be in relationship that the world can recognize the good works that they're doing. And also the leverage of uh, the outside resource to increase their impact. But even if, with them, we are teaching them to create an affiliated nonprofit. We've also done our C2 Leadership Institute with even young individuals, right? Uh, from high school and on. And it, again, is a game changer. It, tra it changes the trajectory of their life because we're teaching them how to shine their light, right? And how to leverage partnerships. Those two talents, right? And just awareness of how to create synergy uh, will take them anywhere uh, because they're going to always become winners, <laughs> you know, because they'll be always contributing and having great ideas and increasing their impact. And again, it will change their trajectory. So it is not just with faith organizations, but there's so few that are working and are trying to empower and equip the faith organizations that we are really intentional. And that is a hard group to work with because they get zero training at seminary. And so we are literally downloading tools, skills, and relationships. So they come uh -huh. out on the other side as Cinderella post fairy godmother, right? And it's like they got a new dude, new carriage, but it's like their PowerPoint, the one minute pitch, and they know how to talk to the prince, which is the funder. So long after they're gone, the prince comes chasing after them, but it would be the funder of partners as well. Awesome, awesome. I was, um, uh, this evening, I'm going to throw it over to you in a minute. I was a member of FAME as well as Joseph Duncan and, and Greg, and I think Stephen may have been as well, especially during uh, the Rodney King and the riots um, when we all galvanized. And I do remember, and I think that's why you look familiar, because I was very involved as well. Um, I do appreciate your candid, candor. Um, but I, I do see it, it again, it's about that pitting of us, right? So we have our messaging and then you have your messaging, but why can't this messaging be the same messaging, right? Because now it's like, remember years ago they did Hands Across America and, and we all came together and we defied the odds that we do not love each other. We do not, and, the, and, and it's because we don't understand each other. We're so segregated in this, in this city that we we have that problem yes i want to give an example about knowing the truth right that will lead to better solutions so i give the example if i need someone to jump from one place to another and they refuse i won't like them too much <laughs> but at least i won't be happy with them mm -hmm. but if i realize that they're in a wheelchair that's going to shift some things right yeah yet it still doesn't take away my need for them to jump but now knowing that they're in a wheelchair, I'm gonna have a very different conversation with them. I'm not gonna just yell at them, 
And right. basically my approach to that solution is going to be quite different. I'm going to either throw them over my shoulder, get some big guys to, you know, whatever. It's going to be a very different approach. So as an example with these store owners, right? They're making so little money. They can't hire from the local community. However, why not put a job uh, training site? The government will pay <laughs> for the worker to get trained. Is a win for the store owner because they get some extra help. Is a win for the worker because now they get job skills, maybe even business skills. And it's a win for the community because they might get better better service. And an unemployed person is now a productive member of society. That answer, that solution would not have come without knowing the truth of the reality of that store owner. Um, and so again, I think I really want to push for fighting for the truth, the greater truth, and asking what do, instead of condemning whoever those others are, but asking like, they're human at the end of the day, why are they behaving this way? And what do they need, right? And I think that will lead to better solutions for all of us in you know addressing that racial divide. I quite agree. Steven, you had your hand up. I'd like to defer to Sarah and then I'll make a closing comment. Sarah? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I know that we're approaching the end of the hour, um, but I, I had a wonderful conversation with Hapen uh, yesterday, and um, I was even there when um, Latasha, um, you guys greeted one another at the uh, press conference and everything. It was, uh, it was genuine, I could see, and I'm glad that it was able to, to take place. Um, but uh, for today, um, you know, she, when we talked, she talked about how, how needing to have data because to make people really understand and know that this is real um, regarding the um, disappearing kind of uh, or, or, or um, not having the visibility for Asians in the sense that of, of um, of um, being a contributing part of the society as much as other uh, communities are. And when you see the data and the numbers and everything, the breakdown, we, it's, to me, it's like a check-in for all of us. We come and we really kind of get re-engaged with really being in tune with each other's communities. And so I just appreciate this opportunity. And thank you today for coming to um, uh, into this forum here. And, um, and and providing us with your um, with your experience and knowledge and everything. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Also, one of the issues we mentioned about the COVID impact. We're fortunate to have Dr. Vicki Mays. And Dr. Vicki Mays, can you briefly uh, give us an update? Sure, would love to, but just wanted to say what I heard was incredible. So um, thank you. Um, cases are ticking up in our community and we're among the few in which these cases are ticking up. And some of that is because we have people who are just getting their first vaccination. When I um, saw that data, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was just sad. So. Um, one of the things that I'm here today to do is to ask you to check among all the people that you know, particularly that are close to you, whether or not they're updated on their vaccinations. And the reason this is getting critical is it's going to start costing. Yeah. As soon as May <laughs> hits, you're going to find that then we will have this problem of health insurance of you know not being able to get drugs so please start now make comments wherever you are if you didn't get vaccinated if you're not up to date do it while it's free because the cost to you remember one of the things that often happens is that medical costs can bankrupt people and what you need to remember is that if people get COVID and they get very sick Again, we're not, we're looking at a health system that is not going to be covering all of this. So I'm just going to hope that everybody will just, you know, at this point, ask people, say something to people in the grocery store line. Oh, I don't know if you know, but if you don't get your stuff done soon, it's going to cost you money. So 
that is all that I want to do today. So thank you so much, Stephen, for giving me the time. Always, Dr. Mays, always. <laughs> if you enjoyed this particular session, you it's part of Black History Month. Next week, we're fortunate to have now Dr. Danny Tabor, who's an adjunct professor at Los Angeles Trade College, Technical College, and we talk about from a historical point of view, locally and nationally. So tune in next week. Those are my closing comments. Robin. Okay, Robin. And, and we're going to have two tables in the house next week. <laughs> I just wanted to affirm the fact that I've known Hyping for a long time and I've seen her walk and I've, I've experienced her walk. And I, again, you know, I, I'm sure people will say, well, why would we have someone like this on for Black History Month? Well, really and truly, the Lord only made one man and one woman. So we're all connected. And the sooner we can actually start working together, the more beneficial the whole community, the whole will be better. And so again, thank you for your courage and thank you for your service. Because again, I know your heart. I know you mean everything that you say because I met you when you were just getting started. And so it's a beautiful thing for us to, to create this alliance with the AAPI community. And again, we, we just wanna thank you for, for having the courage to come on and sharing the knowledge that you share. And knowing too that to our audience, we, are, we welcome anyone who wants to come in and support the community. You know, we all need a lift. And the more people we can get to sign up for our YouTube channel, we can get our individual channel. The more people we can have, you can it help us to invite to bring the resources and information needed to grow our, our communities. That's what we do every week, every week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. This was wonderful, Sarah. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Just want to say thank you for including me. Like I said, I did feel honored, especially on Black History Month. So thank you. <laughs> well, we, we do appreciate we do appreciate your, your messaging. And uh, Robin is right. This is why this platform was created was so that we can hear from the hyphens. We can hear from Dr. Mays. We can hear from everyone that has something that is vitally necessary to be heard within a community. I want to tell you, Hyphen, um, so some of the things that I was, media is very important to me. And one of the reasons is because I, during the, 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 uh, the riot, I, I just kind of marveled at how fast you, the Korean community was able to galvanize their people and to be on alert that they were in danger. And I was told many years later by a good friend of mine, Thomasina, who owns a number of uh, a satellite networks, was well, because you guys have a communication uh, of television networks that you guys speak to each other to inform each other. So for me, that was like, whoa, wait, we need to have the same thing, speaking a message to our people so we understand what's going on and not getting that in information a uh, second hand. So, but it is about us understanding each other's uh, cultures and understanding that we're all one people uh, under, the, under the guidance of God. And so I think if we keep pushing that message um, and if we do that together, so however we can help here at the community briefing, this is a platform for all of us. So please feel free. Uh, if that's how we bridge that gap, then let's use this platform to do that. We're all open to making that happen. Thank you. And I love the concept of community briefing. Maybe I'll copy you. <laughs> okay. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right, we're going to let uh, 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 Renee say something, and then we are out. I want to thank everyone that, to, who come to us every week. Joseph, you just started joining us, and so we're glad to see you again today. Yeshiva, hello. Kim Anthony, hello. And, of course, um, well, I thought that was Yolande, but it's actually <laughs> Jasmine. So thank you guys for, for being here. Come back next week. We have another great, great guest, Dr. Danny Tabor, we want to celebrate him on getting his doctorate, yay, yay. And, um, and so, uh, and we'll see you guys back. This, once I edit this plat this particular um, show, it will be up on our community briefing channel on YouTube. Please subscribe so you will get notifications. So I got to go up and pretty it up a little bit and put our intro in and uh, it'll be ready for consumption. Share it with everyone that you know. Ask them also to subscribe. We're trying to get to our uh, 1,100 viewers, but for our dedicated channel, 
but we want 4,000 viewers so that we can actually start to monetize the, the station, the, the channel. Um, thank you, Sarah, for, for what you're doing as well. And there you go, Miss uh, Renee. Take yourself off mute. Uh, hi, uh, Ms. M. I'm so happy to have been here today. I had no idea that the ratio between the Blacks and the Asians were so close, none at all. And I knew that they were being discriminated against, but not to the numbers that you realized uh, for us today. Um, I heard you say, one of our members asked if there's anything we can do, and I heard you say that your uh your constituents had a difficult time with PPP and were highly discriminated. And I'd like to offer my services if you all need employee retention credit. I can't imagine you haven't been up on it, but if you haven't, I'm here to help you and direct your people uh, wisely that way. Thank you. And uh, I put my email, but I couldn't, I was trying to listen and try to, <laughs> so if you could send me uh, your contact information, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All righty. So uh, thank you, guys. The comments in the chat will be actually on the uh, YouTube channel. I will uh, post them in the in the comments on this YouTube channel so you guys can pull off content information. So once again, thank you, guys. Thank you, uh, Greg. Thank you, Ms. Robin. Stephen has already jumped off. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ms. Heyman. Heyman. And uh, no, there's Stephen. Stephen. And we will see you guys all next week. Same time, same yeah. back channel. Thank you. <laughs> Y'all so come back now here? Y'all come back now, Greg says. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. I mean, I just, did you know Did you know that the ratios were so close to us? You did? did well, I you know, know everything, Stephen. I mean, no. Um, go did ahead. I know who that was. I do know that um, both the, the the Asian community, because they do have they do have the education and the determination, and it's such a broad base of them. Um, you know, because Asian connect. Con oh, uh, <laughs> the Asian continent is you know 